Thank you, Brother Luke, for that wonderful song, one of my favorite hymns of all time, and I appreciate all the music today. It's been a tremendous blessing to be in God's house, and I thank you for coming back tonight and being faithful to uh, the Lord's house and to the church uh, that God has established on our confession, as we found out this morning, and uh, that's how the church is being built, and I'm just glad to be a part of it. And so, uh, as I promised this morning, I want to talk about some of the crazy things that are going on around in our culture. And I promised myself in my notes, I have it right here, don't spend too long on the crazy stuff, okay? Because we could really, literally be up here all night talking about the crazy things that are happening in our society. Uh, I'm not talking about uh, different weather events and hurricanes and, and the, the wildfires and those crazy, uh, very unusual things that are happening. I'm not talking about that. And I'm not talking about my uh, sister and my niece. We were able to spend some time with them Thursday. And uh, my niece was telling me she just got married recently, and she's uh, living in Roswell, New Mexico. And uh, so she was telling us a little bit about uh, the way the weekends go there and some of the festivals and the way people dress like aliens and do all the alien things there. And they're all so uh, adamant about finding the aliens. And so far, no one has found one yet, uh, but they're still looking. And uh, I'm not talking about the crazy stuff like that either. What I'm going to talk about tonight is the crazy uh, lack of morality that we see in our culture and our country today. Uh, Amazing things that are happening. People that are getting upset over a parking spot and shooting people. People that are getting upset and feeling discouraged and depressed and arming themselves with all these automatic weapons and walking into schools and into shopping centers and going on killing sprees. We're talking about people that have uh, done some unbelievably heinous things. And you think to yourself, why would someone do that? I just read an article this afternoon. Uh, along the lines of this, about a, a lady, a woman, I should say, down in Houston, Texas. And she just got the, the, the judgment sentence uh, handed to her that she's going to spend the rest of her life in prison. Because she had a, a child that was Down syndrome, that needed 24-hour care, that needed her the oxygen and all the things that, that uh, goes along with that, the, the care of someone that is completely in a vegetative state the way that she was, the, the child was. And this mom of that child left her the child alone in the house, went out and partied all night long, came back the next afternoon, and the police did a wellness check, and they went in there all together, and the mom and the police found out that the child was dead. Now, what kind of mother would do that? What kind of people are making these kind of decisions? What kind of parents are allowing their children to have sex operations and change their gender and do the things that they're doing now? What kind of parents are allowing these things to happen uh, in their child's life? What kind of a society do we live in when the unborn child is less protected than terrorists coming across the border? We're living in a crazy time. We're living in a lack of utter morality. There's no moral, there's no uh, right, there's no wrong. People seem like they have just lost their mind. But you know, the Bible told us that this was going to happen. The Bible has warned us over and over again that this was going to happen. And I want you to understand why that people are making the decisions morally that they're making today. The Bible says in Proverbs 14, 2, or 12, There is a way which seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You see, when you live it, leave it up to an individual to choose what they want to do and to live their life by their feelings and their desires, the end, the Bible says, of that path and the end of that road is death. Violence that fills the land. In the days of Noah, everyone did that was what was right in their own eyes, in their own sight. They did whatever they wanted to do, and the land was filled. The whole entire world at that time was filled with violence. I don't know about you, I'm sure that you were as appalled as I was just a few years back when all the riots were going on and simple business owners that are just trying to run a business are out there having their whole business and their livelihood burned down. Some of them were attacked, some of them were killed out on the street. Now, how does that happen? Because there's a way that seems right to a man, 
but the end thereof are the ways of death. Genesis 6, 5, I've alluded to it already. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. 1 Timothy 4, 2 kind of wraps it up for us. It says, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. That's where we're at today. That mother that did that to her child has her conscience seared. There is no moral compass there. There is no moral uh, consciousness. There is no right and wrong. There is no biblical or absolute truth in that woman's life. There are just the feelings and the desires that she has that are all selfish, and she's living her life for herself. It's plain and simple. You see, it's like we've lost common sense. It's like we don't even have a conscience anymore. You see, your conscience is developed by what you believe. And when you don't believe anything, you have no conscience. And then the Bible tells us very plainly that if you continue to sin and continue to sin and continue to sin without getting it right with God and without being born again and without being saved, then you are searing, your, searing, your, your fusing, you're burning your conscience to a point there that God will give you in Romans chapter 1 over to a reprobate mind to do whatever it is you want to do. It's an amazing time that we live in. You see, if we look at the definition of conscience, it is a built-in sense of right and wrong, according to vocabulary.com. A built-in, a God-given sense of right and wrong. See, a long, long time ago when everybody decided and psychologists came out with the idea that you shouldn't tell your children what's right and wrong now. You should just let them make up their own mind about what's right and wrong. Don't tell them no. You're going to damage their little psyche. Well, guess what? In all those little kids that their parents decided not to tell them right and wrong, they did not develop a working conscience. It's a built-in sense of what is right and wrong that God gave you. And if you raise your children and you raise a generation the way the Bible commands us to raise it, they will know the difference between right and wrong. But we're not seeing that today. It's as if they have no common sense. You just you read the, the news and the articles. And I, I stopped watching the news a while ago, and I stopped on a lot of social media. I, I just can't handle it. It's, it's too much of an overload. I just think to myself, where are we going? But it's worse than them not having common sense in, in our world today. It's that their conscience is broke. And a lot of times they don't even understand what they're doing. The, the, the God, little g, of this world has blinded their minds. That's what we're talking about. And any time that you put more uh, 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 value on a fish or some animal that's supposed to be going extinct than an unborn child, your conscience is broke. And that's what we see going on today. How does the conscience work? That's a good question. Let's find out why it's broke. John chapter 8, if you'll go to the Gospel of John with me. Now, I'm not trying to get on to anybody tonight, and I'm not trying to just rake over the coals our society or anything to that nature. I'm trying to go somewhere to where we can help ourselves tonight as Christians. Okay? Because we are living in these days of a seared conscience. We're living in the days where men just do whatever they think is right, whatever they want to do. So what do we do and how do we understand what they're doing and why they're doing it? And then how do we live in such a culture? So John chapter 8 and verse 1. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst... They say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? 
Now, they are, notice in verse 6, they're not concerned about the woman. They didn't bring her so she could have her conscience repaired. Okay? They're not trying to help her in her life. They're not concerned about her husband that she is cheating on. Uh, this, in verse 6, tells us why they did what they did. This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. The only reason they brought this woman caught in the act of adultery to Jesus' feet is because they're trying to tempt him and get something on him so that they can get him to stop being popular. Because the Bible tells us over and over again that they were jealous of his popularity. So they didn't come with a conscience toward the woman. They didn't come for a conscience toward the, the husband uh, that had been cheated on. They are just trying to tempt the Lord and get something over him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Now Jesus has perfect hearing, <laughs> you know. He heard what they said and he saw the woman being thrown down in front of him, obviously. But he begins to write on the ground with his finger, and they continue to clamor. Jesus, now we asked you, what are you going to do with this adulterous woman? Moses said in the law this, and this, and this, and this. What are you going to do? We need to know. And Jesus is just writing on the ground. He just keeps writing on the ground. So when they continued asking him, he lift up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Now, most commentators and Bible students will tell you, and I agree, that more than likely, we don't know, the Bible doesn't tell us, but more than likely, Jesus is writing their sins in the ground, on the, in the dirt. I mean, I'm almost convinced of that because of what happens in just a moment. He said to them, as he looks up after he stopped writing on the ground for a minute, if you are without sin... See this right here? <laughs> if none of this applies to you, even though it does, then go ahead and cast the first stone at her. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, see, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone with the woman, and the woman standing in the mix. Now here's what happens. Jesus is writing, I believe, all their sins or something on the ground that convicted them, which would be their sins in my mind. He's writing on the ground. He looks up and he says, hey, any of you that don't have any sins here on the ground, then go ahead and cast the first stone at her. And then the Bible says that according to each person's conscience, their own conscience, not somebody else's, their own conscience... They began to leave, the oldest people left first, and then the youngest people. You know, the young people sometimes are hard-headed. And they think that they haven't sinned. They, I've known a lot of college-age people that didn't think they had done any, anything wrong. Matter of fact, they think they know more than their parents and their professors and everybody. But eventually, even the young people got convicted by their conscience, and they began to walk away. Now, I would propose to you tonight... That what happened here is that when they brought the adulterous woman to Jesus, their conscience was not pricking them. Are you with me? They were not thinking about, oh man, this is the wrong thing to do. We shouldn't tempt the Lord like this. Oh man, you know what? We've all sinned in our life. And she's just sinned the same way that we have. And we really should be showing mercy and grace. No, no, no. None of these men came to Jesus with that attitude. But when Jesus, who is the Word and spoke the Word of God, began to talk to them about their sin, every one of their consciences is like it just sprung up. It's like it came on. It's like a button was turned on. And in their mind and in their heart and in their conscience, all of a sudden they began to realize, hey, I've done some pretty bad things here. Oh, I'm a sinner just like she is. Oh, well, I better not throw a stone at her because somebody's going to throw a stone at me. You see, they were confronted with the Word of God. And they saw their sin and themselves for who they really are. And therefore, their conscience came alive. Now, how does that apply to what we're talking about tonight? Well, there's a problem in our society today. There's not enough preaching and teaching about our sin. 
And therefore, there's people even in the church, but especially out of the church, that have their conscience seared. It's broke. It doesn't work anymore because they have not been confronted by the Word of God with their sin. You see, these guys, I don't know if they were saved or born again. I would seriously doubt it if they're coming to try to tempt the Lord and and trip Him up in the way He's teaching. I very would seriously doubt their salvation. And so these people are, if we would say it this way, they're lost. They're, they're undone. They're unbelievers. They're not a part of the child or the children of God. They're not part of certainly the church. And yet their conscience was pricked, and it came on. The light came on. The machine started working, and they said in their mind, Oh, man, we better leave this lady alone because we are just as guilty as her. You see, a conscience can only help you, the individual, or a society when God's truth is in there. You see, your conscience will not work, and it's on the fast track to being seared when there's none of God's truth in there. Now, this is a very controversial thing that I'm about to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. There are certain Muslim factions that believe that they have the right, and it is even an honor, to murder their children and to burn them to death because of certain of the laws that they break in their society and in their religion. My how a conscience would be seared For you not to even try to have any forgiveness for a sin that your child could have committed. Now, we're not going to get into the the, the debate of whether their their child has sinned or not sinned. But let me tell you, if there's no remorse, there's no forgiveness, there's no want even of restoration there, there's no biblical love, there's nothing there at all, we're just going to burn them. Let me tell you, that's a conscience that's seared. Why? Because there's none of God's truth in there. They have rejected the Word of God. They have replaced the Word of God with the Koran and other things. They have uh, denied the fact that Jesus is the, lo- the Son of God. They have denied salvation the way the Bible says it. They've denied these things. They don't believe those things. And so there's no, none of God's truth is in their mind, and therefore their conscience is seared. And they commit to us what, is, what are heinous acts, and they think that they're worshiping their God. The children of Israel got to that place. They were offering their children on the sacrifice. They were offering their children to a false god. Why? Because there was no biblical truth in their minds. There was no truth of God's word in their mind at that time. Now notice in our text tonight in the book of Titus. Titus. And I want you to see in verse 1, or chapter 1, verse 10. And we're going to look at a big portion of Scripture, but don't despair. We're not going to go verse by verse and word by word on it. I just want to show you the, the context, the, the idea here, okay? Titus chapter 1 and verse 10. But now, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now that's a good start. Whereunto I, Timothy said, or Paul says, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, he says, for I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This thou knowest, or that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Now what's he doing? He's encouraging us here in the book of Titus to make sure that we continue to hold fast to the sound doctrine, to the word of God, to the truths that we find in the Bible. This thou knowest, 
that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, Paul says, of whom are Phygellus and Hermogenes. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligent. I'm sorry, I'm in Timothy, no wonder. I knew somebody said something over there, and I couldn't remember what they I couldn't hear what they were saying. Titus chapter 1, verse 10 would be better. Titus, yes. I said Titus three times, but I was in Timothy. Titus chapter 1 and verse 10 says this. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped to subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Christians are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Now look at this. We've talked about they're subverting whole houses. They're deceiving. They're vain talkers. They have Jewish fables. they got commandments of men. They have everything but the truth of God's Word. They're teaching everything but what God's Word says. Unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. There it is. Their mind and their conscience is defiled. It's seared. It's burned with a hot iron. There's no conscience there anymore. And then we wonder, why would they do such a thing? Why would they kill these people? Why would they do these things? How could they even fathom to do that? How can they in their heart uh, understand and even sometimes honor and sometimes glorify the things that they're doing? It's because their mind and their conscience is defiled. It's gone, if you will. It doesn't work anymore. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him being abominable and disobedient. And unto every good work, reprobate. Now, I don't know if, if that describes to you the culture that we live in, but boy, it does to me. We live in a world that professes that they know God. There's all these people in our society today, especially in America, that profess to be a Christian. But their life does not reflect them being a Christian at all. They don't live like a Christian ought to live. They don't talk like a Christian ought to talk. They don't walk. They don't have their life. They don't have their lifestyle. They don't have the same goals. They don't have the same desires as a Christian should have. And then they begin to get into these very heinous, very horrible sins in their life. And then they want to take the Bible and justify for why they're doing what they're doing. You see, in works, they deny him. And it's worse than that, they're abominable to God. They're an abomination to God. They're disobedient. And in every single thing that they do, they're reprobates. Now, you need to do a good Bible word study on that word, reprobate. We won't take time to do that tonight. But I, a long time ago, back in the Baptist churches, that was one of the worst things you could call somebody. So we're seeing in all these texts of scriptures that in the end times, there's coming a day when everyone in the culture that's an unbeliever, most people will have a seared conscience. They will not accept the word of God as truth, and they will live their lives just like in the days of Noah, doing whatever their imagination allows them and wants them to do. So what should we do? Living in a society like that. What can we do when there's not all the people that just believe in the Bible and believe in the, Bi the God of the Bible and believe in salvation and believe in heaven and believe in hell and they're living their life trying to serve the Lord when all of our situation in has changed, and it has. When all that starts happening, what are we supposed to do? Paul tells his young preacher boy in the ministry, Titus, chapter 2, verse 1. But speak thou... The things which become sound doctrine. He says, hey, just keep teaching and preaching the word of God. Why do we have doctrine study on Wednesday night? Because you need your conscience working. That's why. 
We need to know what we believe, and we need to know how we're supposed to act. And the only way you find those truths is in the Word of God. And so we're just going to keep preaching and keep teaching. And I need you as people of the church, people that are Sunday school teachers, people that are deacons, people that are leaders in this church, I need you to just keep teaching and preaching. Because there might be somebody that get a little bit of conscience here and there. Now, we're not going to turn the tide on this whole entire country, just our church. But we might can make a difference in Gracie County. We, can't, we might can make a difference in one family. We might can make a difference in, in a, a section of town or somebody that is in a certain group of people. You might can be able to make a difference in their conscience. And then they would not create and do these horrible things that people are doing. And the, the craziest thing about it at all is they don't think they're horrible. Matter of fact, they get mad at you when you point them out. So Paul tells Titus, when all these things are happening, what you need to do is speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. And then he tells us in verse 2, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, and charity and patience. You know what he's saying there? Hey, you that have your conscience where it's supposed to be and it's in tune with God and you've had years and years of blessing of being in God's house and being under the preaching and the sound teaching of the Word of God, what you need to do, aged men, is you need to be sober, you need to be vigilant, you need to be the example that these young people need. And then he has something to say about the older ladies too. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. Not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. Somebody didn't teach that lady in Houston to love her kids. To be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. You know, some of the older ladies in here in our church ought to teach the younger ladies how to be submissive to their husband but still have their own independence and individuality you know that's a skill it's what God would have us to do but how is a girl grown up in a broken home and a dysfunctional family how is she and she's never had any experience in the church and she comes to our church and she's married to a guy how is she just automatically going to know how to be submissive she's not and see the Bible says that the older ladies are supposed to teach They're supposed to model it. They're supposed to show you. And if you think it's just about all the older people, young people, it's not. Verse (laughs) 6. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed having no evil thing to say of you. What are we supposed to do in a culture that we live in, in the culture where everyone seems like their their conscience is seared, at least the vast majority of people are teaching things that are false, they're rewriting history, they're trying to convince us of all kinds of ungodly things that are not true in our society, in our schools, in our universities, in our culture. When all these things start going this way, what are we supposed to do? Just keep teaching and preaching. And we, in every group, wherever you find yourself, you're supposed to be an example of the believer. You should be an example to the younger people. Younger people, you should be sober and grave. You should understand how important the things of God are. You should understand how important church is. You should understand that how important it will be for you to have a godly family one day. You see, we need to understand these things. Because our culture is not going to get better. Those of you that are just waiting on the rapture to get you out of this mess, shame on you. No, really. There's a whole world that's dying and going to hell out here, and all of y'all are just doing rapture practice. Now, I'm ready for the Lord to come. Don't get me wrong. And I'm excited about that day, and I dream about it sometimes. But let me tell you, we got a lot of work to do. And those of you that are thinking that the whole entire aspect and the whole entire culture of America is going to change just one day from the next... Not likely. Now, God can bring revival anytime, anywhere that he wants. 
But let me tell you, historically speaking, when a nation goes the way that our nation has went, it ain't coming back. You say, well, preacher, what about this and what about that? Hey, Second Chronicles is in the book. And if we did, as a nation and as a, as a Christian people, if all of us got together and did that, God would bring revival. But we have to be ready and prepared for the opposite of that. Because the Bible says very clearly that in the last days it's going to be like the days of Noah. And so what do we do when we look around and we see people making crazy decisions and the immorality and the lack of morals and the seared conscience and they're doing things that are just uh, abhorrible, just horrible things and they're, they're proud of it. You know, at least, at least back in the day when people sinned and they had a sinful lifestyle, they tried to hide it from everybody. Certainly wasn't parading down the street. Oh, let me tell you, church, we're living in the last days. Now, how long the last days, I don't know. How long they last, I don't know. But let me tell you, it's our job, and what Paul told under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to Brother Titus was just keep preaching and teaching. And every group that you find in the church age-wise, they need to be the example that God wants them to be to the other group of people. It's what we need to do. Now, let me tell you, I had in my notes and I had in my mind about 400 other things that I wanted to say about crazy things that are going on. We are living in a crazy society. It really is. But we can either hide our head in the sand and lock ourselves in a closet, or we can go out and be the light and the salt that God wants us to be and I don't know about you but I don't want to retire and I don't want to resign myself and I don't want to lock myself up in some closet I want to do everything I can to be the light that God wants me to be to be an encouragement even if it's just to one person even if you just spark alive the consciousness of one single person at least you will have done something oh let me tell you church we're living in difficult times no doubt about that but God has a job for us to do each and every one of us and that is to continue teaching and preaching and being the example that God wants us to be. Would you stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed? Every head bowed and every eye closed. You see, we preach and teach because their conscience is broke. And we can't get discouraged. We can't get weary in the way. We just got to keep on serving the Lord the way the Lord would have us to. Heavenly Father. Lord, I know that this has been a very confrontational message in calling out some things that are going on in our society, Lord, and we don't repent of that. We don't back down from that. That's what your word has told us to do is to mark sin and to make it abundantly clear. But, Lord, I pray that you would help the people in our church and even maybe some that, have, that would see this on, on some other technological platform, Lord, that you would help them to understand the attitude behind this message. It's not to to rip and to, to condemn and to, to badmouth people in our society. Lord, their conscience is just broke. It's just seared. They don't have any one even shred of ounce of the biblical truth in their mind. And Lord, a lot of times if we think about it and we look back on our lives, a lot of that comes back on us because we haven't been the witness that we ought to be. We can't take responsibility for every single person that has a seared conscience. But, Lord, there's people in our lives that we could have influenced. We could have been an example to. We could have given some gospel to. We could have given some word of the word of God to them. Might have made a difference. Lord, would you help us to commit ourselves to when the opportunity is there and when we're able that we would share some truth with every single person that we're able to so that maybe something would spark their conscience like the conscience was sparked there with those men that brought that woman to you. Would you help us tonight? Help us as we look into our lives and our hearts to see if maybe our conscience isn't a little bit seared because of the culture we live in. Would you help us speak to us tonight? We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.